Carnivorous plants are exactly as they seem, a plant that eats animals to survive. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard of the Venus flytrap or Tiania mesupula, a plant that lures in unsuspecting flies to land on their leaves, promising a tasty snack for the fly only to be consumed by their jaws. In this clip here, you can see Gerald was quickly consumed with no idea what happened, but Samson shows up to try to help his buddy out. While he's trying to find a hole for his friend to escape, Peggy falls victim to the same fate as Gerald. In a giant plot twist, we learn Samson isn't the sharpest tool in the shed, as he's also consumed by the fly trap. So how exactly does a fly trap eat a fly? Let's get into this. Typically there are three fine hairs on each side of the trap. You can see there are four on the left side here, and once two of these highly sensitive hairs are triggered within 30 seconds of each other, the trap snaps shut. This prevents the trap from reacting to wind, rain, leaves, or pollen blowing around. The Venus flytrap is an upgraded version of more primitive types of carnivorous plants that lure in insects to have them get stuck with a sticky goo. This method works but allows creatures like lizards to come steal their catch. By evolving a system of a closed trap, their captured fly cannot be stolen and they can completely absorb the nutrition from the fly. This system is so smart that the interlocking teeth of the fly trap will lock halfway, allowing small bugs to escape through the gaps. This ensures that the fly trap is only spending its energy capturing large prey. A fly freaking out inside the fly trap, like Gerald here, will continually trigger the hairs over and over, which signals the trap to completely chomp and close to digest the fly. What's most surprising about the Venus fly trap, though, is the mechanism that opens and closes the trap. There are no muscles involved, but instead pockets of water in the inner part and pockets in the outer layer. It takes a while for the water to fill into the inner pockets, which forces the trap open, and as the hairs are stimulated, they send an electric charge to these cells, but will only dump the water from the inner cells to the outer cells, as mentioned earlier, if triggered twice within 30 seconds. Once triggered, the water is transferred almost instantaneously to the outer cells, releasing the negative pressure, forcing the trap shut. As the fly keeps brushing against the hairs, the cells are further drained until the trap is completely empty. Venus fly traps are found in nutritionally devoid soil on rocky areas or in bogs, often in waterlogged soil, but never in dry climates. Because of these living conditions, they rely on eating animals, as we've learned here, for nutrition versus pulling it from the soil. Next up we have the Gerosa angelica or English sundew, another carnivorous plant that uses the same principle but a different technique to capture its prey. This perennial herb is covered by a dense layer of maglationous glands or this sticky gland stuff. Each are tipped with a clear droplet of viscous fluid intended to lure in insects. The sugary scent brings them in and once they start to take a drink, they'll get stuck. Depending on the size of the insect, some will easily escape or think nothing about how sticky it is. As the insect drinks from the gland, the sundew will start bending additional tentacles towards their prey and glue them in place. This glue is so effective that these small plants can catch something as big as a butterfly. Once the prey is locked in, they will start to wrap a leaf around the insect, which will happen over hours or even days. The insect will be digested and all that is left is the exoskeleton of the bug. English sundews are found in northern regions across North America, Europe and Russia, with the odd subtropical group of them being found in southern Europe and on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. Another example of the Drosura, this time the Rotundifolia. While using the same sticky glands to lure and stick their prey, this one is almost a mixture of a Venus flytrap and the Anglica. Prey will land on this, not only will the gland juice stick to the insect, but the petal will also close on them. You can see a fly right here. These grow in the same region of the world as the previous one and will grow in poor soil. Ammonia from the proteins in the insect along with other nutrients are extracted from the body. The ammonia essentially replaces the nitrogen the plant would get from the soil. There are many Derosa species out there, but one more real quick, we have the Spatulata. This one is a lot more hardy than most and develops a unique stack of carnivorous gland-filled leaves with a flower on top. 
These leaves will start reaching towards the flower, creating essentially a minefield of gooey treats for insects with no way to escape. Next we have one from the Pingucula family, the Morinensis. This unsuspecting carnivorous plant has a secret reservoir that aims sticky gland juice in the stalk of the plant. A very thin layer of this liquid is present on top of the leaf, giving a reflective wet appearance, indicating to insects to come and land for a treat. When the insect lands on the leaf, they are immediately glued down, and as they start to struggle, the morensis will unleash a torrent of this goo from the stalk to encapsulate and ensure the insect isn't going anywhere. As this bug is broken down, the goo and the nutrients from the insect are absorbed back into the leaf, leaving once again only the exoskeleton. What is super interesting about these plants is that they will shed their gland leaves for non-gland leaves in October to protect themselves during the dry season through the winter until it rains in May. Unlike the others, this one doesn't live in the north, but in southern Mexico, so essentially they go dormant when there's no water coming down. Coming from northern Sumatra, the Nepenthes jamban was discovered in 2004. This climbing plant produces upper pitchers and lower pitchers. The upper pitchers are able to capture larger prey like crickets and wasps, where the lower pitchers are much smaller and designed to attract and snag smaller insects. The upper pitchers are generally yellow or orange, where the lower ones vary from red, purple to yellowish orange. The trap of the Nepenthes jamban uses a pool of mucolaginous liquid as the final resting place for the insects. The inner walls are lined with the liquid which draw in creatures tempted by the sweet taste but become entangled in it as they slide down into the pool. To ensure success capturing its prey, Jamban has a small lid on top, the pitchers, that will close after the insect is inside. Jumping up in size, we have the Nepenthes Raja, endemic to Mount Kinabulu in Borneo. Able to hold up to 3.5 liters or just under a gallon of water, this makes it the largest in the genus by volume. Forget trapping bugs, this trap can capture lizards, birds, frogs, mountain tree shoe, and rats. A pair of fringed wings on the mouth of the pitcher is believed to guide animals into the pitcher. These pitchers, just like the previous plant, have upper and lower pitchers, but the upper ones are quite rare. These upper pitchers don't have a pair of fringed wings and are designed to capture insects and birds. This one works in a different way, as the gland will excrete liquid from the underside of the lid, and as the animal drinks the liquid, it'll close the lid capturing the prey. The distance from the lid to the fringed wings are the exact length of mountain tree shoe, which indicates that is their intended target. What is fascinating about this is when a mountain tree shoe is feeding, they'll poop to mark their territory, and because the distance is just right, that poop will go inside the pitcher. So even if they are too wise to the tricks of the Raja, the Raja will obtain most of the nitrogen it needs just from the mountain tree shoe's poop. Being so unique and colorful, this plant, while rare, is starting to be cultivated and obtained by plant collectors, which has increased its popularity and thus its survival rate. Only found in a few remote areas of Kinabulu National Park, the Nepenthes Ali Sapurana is closely related to the previous one, but is known for its brown or red spots. There are also Nepenthes Kinabulansis, which doesn't grow as big but is iconic for its highly developed ribs on the mouth of the pitcher. These pitchers vary in color from yellow to red and tend to produce more upper pitchers than the other species. Finally, the Darlingtona californica or cobra lily. Named this due to its resemblance to a cobra with fangs, this carnivorous plant was discovered in 1841 at Mount Shasta in California. It thrives in poor acidic soil in bogs or other not so habitable places and can even survive a forest fire by regenerating their roots as their roots are a delicate organ. Despite it being a pitcher, it doesn't trap rainwater, but instead is full of sticky liquid that is pumped upwards from the root. Once the prey enters the pitcher, the Californica will curl the exit up to prevent escape, but also has multiple translucent false exits within its structure to confuse its prey. Downward pointing hairs force their prey into the trap along with slippery walls. The cells on the inside of the pitcher are the same as the ones on the roots that absorb nutrients after the prey is broken down. Three color morphs can occur, all green, all red, or green-red bicolor. These plants die down to their rhizomes and go dormant through the winter. 
In spring, a new large pitcher will develop, with smaller ones being created through the summer. Which one of these carnivorous plants did you find most interesting? Share your thoughts in the comments down below. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe, and until next one, have a good one.